Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Crossroads again. I'm so glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. Whether you are here in Westminster or you are joining us online, you're joining us for part four of a series of messages that we have entitled Love Illustrated. Our series of talks leading up to Easter uh, next Sunday, Easter Sunday. And you've heard about inviting uh, friends and, and neighbors, co-workers. And let me remind you that we also have a Good Friday service where we'll be having communion. Uh, and there are two Good Friday times. And then um, Saturday evening here in Westminster, uh, a six o'clock uh, service uh, for Easter. And then our three normal times, eight, 9.30 and 11 a.m. on Easter Sunday. And so we would encourage you, uh, if you have the opportunity to, to choose a, a service other than 9.30 or 11, to, to make plans to do that. Or if you want to go to, to Hampstead, uh, we have plenty of parking and seats available there. And we would also just encourage you to bring your kids. And uh, that we have children's programming at every service. Uh, so uh, plan accordingly, but we are uh, really hopeful that we're going to have a, a super weekend uh, next, next weekend for Easter. So I hope you'll plan on joining us um, to celebrate uh, the risen Christ. Now, um, we are in part four of this series, and we've been focusing on 1 Corinthians chapter 13 as it teaches us about love. If you're just joining us, 1 Corinthians 13 is that passage you hear read at weddings all the time love is patient love is kind love does not envy and we've talked about that in the fact that in the way it was written it was not supposed to be received by a lovey dovey um, way at all in fact if you were in Corinth in this church in in Corinth reading that nobody said oh isn't that so special you know Let, let's Let's crochet that and put it up on our wall or something like that. In fact, it was a bombshell in many ways because we learned that what the Apostle Paul, who wrote the letter, was communicating was that you can, doesn't matter what else you do, if you miss on the love meter, you've missed it completely. That without love, you've completely missed the point. Doesn't matter how right you are, doesn't matter how generous you are, if you don't love people, all of it amounts to nothing. And, and the setting is important because it was written to this group of people who thought they were doing fairly well. They, they equated the way that they were gifted and the success that they had uh, received, had experienced, with God's work in their hearts. And this letter says, no, you, you missed it. Because it doesn't really matter uh, how gifted or how talented or how successful you are. Uh, all of that boils down to, do you love people? And so in the previous chapter, chapter 12, they're all talking about different gifts that they have and who's got the better gifts. And, you know, I know that sounds crazy to you today, that in a church there would be, you know, any sort of disagreement about who's more important, which ministry should get the, I know that never happens today, but back then, that was an issue. And so, this chapter was written as a response to this, saying, look, the really important thing is not whether you're in youth ministry or missions, it's do you love people? Do, do you love people the way God loves them? So, then we talked about, well, what is love? And we said, gosh, it's not what I thought it was. And last week, we began to learn that love is a person, uh, that it doesn't say here in 1 Corinthians 13, you should be patient, you should be kind, you should not envy. It says love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy. And the personification of love, we learned last week, is so important because it's not a checklist for us to attain, it is a person for us to meet. And we said that in order to do love, you first have to receive love from love the person. And that there is a love that you can count on that always trusts, always hopes, always endures, always perseveres, and never fails. And that's your Heavenly Father. 
That, that is the love of God for you and for me. And in order to receive that love, we said last week, the only requirement is that you would admit that you need it completely. That, that, that you can't earn it and therefore be in control. That you must receive it freely from the grace of God. So, uh, I, I want to do one more lesson before Easter from 1 Corinthians 13 on, on love. We're going to learn one more thing about love today. So if you have a Bible, uh, open it up to 1 Corinthians 13 again. And I'm going to read th- this last section, verses 8 to 12. We'll leave verse 13 for Easter Sunday. But verses 8 to 12 paint another really compelling picture and teach us something very, very important about love. So let's read it. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there's knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. When I was a child, I I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection, as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Uh, This is God's Word. And in it, boy, it... It makes this claim about love that's so critical for everyone in the room. It says love is the way you grow up. In other words, love is the sign, is the sign of maturity in your faith. That that as you and I go on this journey of faith with Christ, as Christ followers, love is the marker of how much progress we make in that journey. So I just want to make two points this morning. I know sometimes I have uh, three and uh, they're memorable and that kind of thing. Only two points today because they're so rich and, and packed with meaning and application. So here they are. One, you need to grow up. And two, you're not there yet. Number one, Everyone in the room, uh, if, if you have uh, made the, the decision to, to follow Christ, you need to grow. You need to grow up. And number two, you're not there yet. You're not finished yet. And so if you're here this morning and you are discovering what it means to be a follower of Jesus, this is a great day to be here because you'll get the, the whole picture. And maybe by the end, you'll have more information about what that looks like to have a relationship with Christ. All right, so let's do these two points. Number one, this scripture teaches us that you have to grow up, that this is the way that love works. It grows in you. You you start as a child. Everybody, without exception, starts as a child and, and, and must grow, and love is the marker of how much you've grown. Um, It's a slow and sometimes imperceptible process. In other words, you can't, just like physically, you can't grow up in a hurry. Have you ever tried doing that? Like you you, you wanted to get taller. Maybe it's to make it on so you pass the stick at the carnival or at the amusement park where you could ride the ride and you'd try to do things that would make you grow quicker that never worked right yeah it doesn't work spiritually either the the scripture here is teaching us that growth spiritually is an awful lot alike growing physically you can't hurry the process up it's the sign of spiritual life because everything that is alive grows but that growth happens just like it does physically very gradually, sometimes imperceptibly. But if it's not happening, there's a problem. Would you agree with that? 
Think about this, the physical realm for a moment. If, if someone physically ever stops growing, if you have a baby that's born and they don't grow, they call in all the experts. Why? Because growth is not optional. If, if you're not growing, something's wrong and you need to address it. The same is true spiritually. If you're not growing, something's wrong and you need to address those issues because every thing that is alive grows no one you can't skip this over this process no no one starts like what's the guy's name benjamin button you know where he starts old no one does that in real life or in real spiritual life no one starts already grown up and the scripture is really clear in lots of places about this growth process and the expectation of it you could look at Hebrews chapter 6 or Ephesians chapter 4, and it talks about you need to keep growing. Don't ever stop growing in your faith. Grow towards maturity. 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter writes to a group of people and he says, look, you've been eating baby food and now it's time for you to mature. You need to grow up so that you can eat solid food spiritually. In this One book here, the next chapter of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, stop thinking like children. You need to grow up. So growth, it turns out, is not optional. It's natural. And if it's not happening, there's a problem. And love is the primary marker of progress in this maturity process. Now, why is that? Well, One reason is because becoming a Christian is not like joining a club. Now, I know that an awful lot of times it's portrayed like that, and that's exactly wrong. That in the Bible, becoming a Christ follower is not like joining a club. It's not like you start attending meetings and you learn the rules of the club and you learn the lingo of the club. Uh, Remember those when you would uh, go back to college those of you went to college or even high school i know they have those activity fairs right and so all the clubs are out there and they they have their little booth and maybe they have giveaways to lure you in to see if you you want to be a part of of the gang or not and and if you were to join one of those clubs what would be expected of you is that you would attend their meetings and that you would follow their rules maybe you would pay their dues and you would learn their lingo, and then you're part of the gang. Now, here's the problem. So many times, that's what gets portrayed as the Christian life. Like, to become a Christian, that's exactly what you do. You you test it out. You you start going to meetings. You learn the rules. You pay your dues. You learn the lingo, and then you're part of the gang. And nothing could be farther from the truth. And that's why the Scripture never uses that language. What it says is it's like being born. And sometimes people are, uh, are confused or are turned off or have baggage about this idea of being born again. It's a very simple and, and helpful metaphor for saying, let me tell you what it's like. To be a Christ follower is not like joining a club. You don't go sign up, go to meetings, pay dues, and learn the rules. What you do is you're born. You have a new nature. Something brand new has happened. And it's as new as being born. And that's, that's very, very different than joining a club. And is why then growth is not optional. It's, it's natural. And it happens organically. And love is the sign that you are maturing, that you are growing spiritually. Now, that's really critical. Why? Because it means that knowledge or aptitude or gifts or money or talent are not the marker of spiritual growth. That love is the primary sign that you are maturing that you are growing spiritually and if you think about it 
that makes sense. Because um, kids, babies, are the opposite of what love is described here, right? Think about kids. Uh, are kids patient? No, not usually, right? Are, are kids kind just naturally? No, probably not. Do kids envy? Do the kids boast? Do, right? Love is everything that kids are not. Love is a sign that there is growth happening here. Because kids are focused on the loud and the immediate. Right? Think about uh, your kid. Think about uh, the things that capture their attention. It's usually uh, bright, loud, immediate, bright colors. Lot. Think about what kind of movie would you take your six-year-old to? I, we'd all have the same response, probably. You're going to go to a, either a, a Disney movie or an action movie. Lots of, you know, noises and colors and things. You're probably not going to pick for your six-year-old a movie with lots of character development, you know, uh, drawn-out dialogue, you know, nuanced plot twists. Right, what's your six-year-old going to do? They're going to disrupt, you know, everybody else in the movie theater uh, if the shoe fits. Where? Don't take your kid to those movies, right? Why? Because kids like the immediate and the quick. They, they demand an immediate feedback loop for their actions. And love, listen, listen. Love operates in just the opposite way. The, the love that we're described here in 1 Corinthians 13 is developed usually slowly, quietly, in the background. Sometimes almost imperceptible. Not a lot of fanfare. So what does this mean? You need to grow up. Love is the marker for growing up. And if you're a kid, you won't necessarily gravitate towards the things that love demands. Well, it means this. That you may have a lot to learn from someone who in a worldly sense you would not look up to. Think about that. If if you are someone in the middle of your life who decides to follow Christ, there are an awful lot of people who you may think you have nothing to learn from, that you have everything to learn from. Why? Because you're a kid. And while they may not have uh, as much money as you, or they might not be as smart as you, or as gifted and talented as you, they love better than you do. Because they've grown in their walk with Christ. Uh, more than you have. And that's, that's a difficult thing when you come into a church environment and you're used to being the one who's in charge, but you're a baby in Jesus. And, and you have not grown yet, and you can learn a lot from those people who are more mature in their faith than you are. What else does it mean? Well, it may mean that if you've been coming to church for 20 years and you're not any more loving than you were when you started, that might be a problem. We are, well, but I know, I know a lot more. I've been on a bunch of trips. I've given a lot of money. Go back to 1 Corinthians 13. It says those aren't markers of growth. Love is. If you're not any more loving than you were 20 years ago, Houston, we have a problem. Right? There's, there's really two potential problems. Let me describe it this way, and then we'll move on. There's two potential growth problems that you might observe in the body of faith, in, in the congregation of believers, right? Um, one would be an 8-year-old who's acting like an 18-year-old. Think about that. Think about if I went and pulled out an 8-year-old from the elementary school 252 Main Street ministry, and I pulled him over here and I interviewed this eight-year-old. And I said, you know, so what kind of things are you interested in these days? And he said, oh, you know, normal stuff like driving. Uh, you think, wait, wait, wait. You think, well, you're eight years old. He says, yeah, but 
I know that that seems like an arbitrary you know, age, 16. Why do you have to be 16 to drive? Because I feel like I'm perfectly equipped to do it. I know all the right stuff, and I think I'm, I'm ready to drive. But that, that makes like those YouTubes, right, of people who their kid gets in and drives off. No, no, you're eight. And the worst thing you could do if you're eight is pretend that you're 18. And the same is true spiritually, right? Some of you need to just admit that you're still eight and that you've got some growing to do. And that's okay. In a spiritual sense, someone who's eight acting like they're 18 is someone who tends to give quick, simple answers to complex painful problems and sometimes it does more harm than good it's somebody who says uh i used to be but i'm now i'm all better that's an eight-year-old acting like an 18 year old it's someone who says i can fix you all you have to do is the five steps to spiritual victory just do them and you'll be fine that's an eight-year-old acting like an 18 year old the, the, the most, the healthiest thing you could do is admit that you're a kid and say, I've got a lot of, gro- I don't know. It, the more that you would use this line, I don't, I don't know. I can't explain it. I won't try to explain your pain away. I'll just be with you. I don't know. I don't know why God did that for them and didn't do it for me. I don't know. Why? I'm a kid. I, I'm eight. I don't, I don't know. See, the moment that you admit you're a child, you begin to grow up. That's, that's one problem. If you're an eight-year-old, you're acting like you're an 18-year-old. That's a problem. Here's the other one. You're an 18-year-old, and you're acting like an eight-year-old. <laughs> this is not good either. And, and think about that. Some of you are like, I live with that. Can I tell you, <laughs> right? Um, I, could, I should have said 38, right? No. Uh, so the 18-year-old is acting like an 8-year-old in what way? And they, they refuse to take responsibility or they're unaware of how their actions are affecting others, right? They're 18. It's time to act like an 18-year-old, to, to, to be your age. How does that look spiritually? Well, Spiritually, it's the same thing. If you are not taking responsibility for your own growth, you're an 18-year-old acting like an 8-year-old. In other words, if you've been coming to church for 20 years and you utter this line, I'm just not being fed there. Yeah, you're an 18-year-old acting like an 8-year-old. What do you do if your 18-year-old says, well, nobody was here to make me a meal? (laughs) You say, are your legs broken? You're 18. Go feed yourself. It it happens when you're unaware of how your actions affect other people. It happens when spiritually you continue to think everything revolves around you. Let me tell you, this might hit a little closer to home. If you've been coming to Crossroads for 10 years and you still complain about the music, you're 18 acting like you're 8. It's not about you. It doesn't all revolve around you you all right so point number one you need to grow up every one of you and me included number two you're not there yet neither am i we're not finished with the growth process and there will be a finish to that process and we read about it here look at verse 10 it says this when perfection comes the imperfect disappears that's so interesting that that word perfection there sometimes it's translated completeness might be in your um, translation is the word totelion Um, and that word totelos really literally means design or the the aim of something it's where we get our word telescope from right the aim the design And and what verse 10 is saying is that there is a me that I was designed to be. 
it's, it's probably actually the me that I'm aiming to be as a Christ follower. And this teaching is this. There is a place and a time when we become that person. When, when all that we were meant to be, all that we had hoped to be, all that we were designed to be becomes a reality. There is a time, but you're not there yet. And so what, what do we do in the meantime? How do we understand that and how should it affect us now as we grow, as we grow up? Verse 12 gives us a hint. I love this. It's maybe my favorite verse so far in the whole thing. It says, Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now, th this word, th this picture that it's given us is right now, I'm not there yet. I'm not the me that I'm even aiming to be. And so right now, I look in a mirror, and what I see is, and it says, a poor reflection, or many old King James versions said, as in a mirror dimly or darkly. And that word, poor reflection, or dimly or darkly, is actually the word where we get our word enigma from. You know what enigma is? It's two things that I can't seem to reconcile. Think it's a riddle. <laughs> and, and so here's this teaching is while I'm still growing, I look into a mirror and I'm just in a I just I don't get me. <laughs> Can anybody relate? Is it just me? I look and I go, ah, uh, yes, yes, but those two things don't seem to go together. I'm a riddle, even to myself. And why is that? It's because I'm not there yet. I'm not the me that I was designed to be yet. And the yet is so important because it says that there is a time, there is a place where I will be that me. And it, and it describes it this way. Then I will look. Now I look and I see a riddle. <laughs> I see an enigma as I look in a mirror. But then, what does it say? I will see yeah, face to face. Whose face? Well, it doesn't say there's any mirror anymore. So it's not my face. The only way I can see my face is if I look in a mirror. Whose face? Yeah, the face of God. It says there will be a day where I will come face to face with my Creator. That His face will be the thing that I can see perfectly. And when perfection comes, right? You see that? Perfectly see Him. This is the, the theologians would call it the beatific vision. When we will see Christ face to face. And 1 John 3 says, and when we see Him, we will be like Him. We will be completely like Him. Perfectly like Him. Do you see that? That there will be a time. I'm not there yet. I'm on my way to that. And so are you as a Christ follower. But I'm not there yet. Now it says I know in part. I look in the mirror and I go. I don't even get me half the time. Now I know in part. But then I will know. What does it say? Fully. Yeah, I will know fully. Even as I am fully known. Notice that it doesn't say even as I will be fully known. It says, even as I am already fully known. Who knows you fully right now? Not you, <laughs> right? Me neither. God does. God knows you and me fully, completely, perfectly right now. That's a scary thought for some of you. And that picture of seeing the face of God and being known fully by him is the whole Old Testament, right? All the way leading up to the book of Matthew in the Bible is a story about people who are after the face of God. I want to see God's face. I, I want, they yearn to see the face of God and they're terrified by it, which seems odd, which creates all sorts of odd encounters in the Old Testament. Why are they so afraid? 
If they, they want it so badly, they know that they need it. Psalm 16 says, in your face there I will find joy, purpose. When they get close to it, they all fall apart. Isaiah gets close to it and he says, woe is me, I am an unclean man. What, what is this story that's going on of the face of God that everyone is on a quest to find, but yet when they get near it, they are terrified because they feel like it will kill them. Well, I'll tell you why. Because think about it this way. If you owed someone a, a very, very large sum of money, a, a debt that you, you knew that there was no way that you could pay, what would your activity be like around that person? Would you be seeking them out? Would you be looking forward to a face-to-face encounter with them? Heck no, you wouldn't. Well, you'd be dodging them. You'd be avoiding them, right? So you wouldn't, because you knew you owed and couldn't pay. Well, that's the story of us and God. That's the human story. See, we all know that there's a life that we owe that we can't live up to. And so even though we desire deeply to see God face to face, we know to do so would be deadly. That there is a debt that we cannot pay. So we avoid. The wages of sin, it says, is death. And God knows that. So the whole Old Testament, people are saying, please let me see your face. And God says, no, it wouldn't be good for you. I'll I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock, Moses. Um, Isaiah, I, I will, you can see me as I pass by, my goodness, but you can't see my face. Why? Because we owed. We couldn't pay. And now you know what Jesus was doing on the cross when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, Jesus lost the face of God. So that you could find it. This is, the, this is the message of Easter. This is what we are going to proclaim to anyone who will listen next weekend. Jesus turned to God and got rejected. So that when you turned to God, you could get his face. The thing that you are after. The thing that makes you the you that you're aiming to be. You are, we all are, fully known and fully loved today. I don't know if you knew that. Maybe that's news to you. You are fully known and fully loved today, right as you sit, without doing one other thing. And love is the offer from your heavenly Father that you must receive by by admitting that you don't have any opportunity to gain it without Him giving it to you. And you receive that. And you begin to grow. Just like a baby. Grow in love. If you're not growing, maybe you never start it. You can decide that today. You can say, look, I don't know what the problem is, but I want to receive the love of God so that it would grow in me and I would grow to the me that I'm aiming to be. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up here and as they do, would you pray with me? God, our Father, thank you for a love that translates over thousands of years and still uh, makes my heart beat fast when I hear that I'm fully known and fully loved. Thank you for the promise of one day I will be the me that I aim to be. I know I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm a riddle, even to me. But I'm so thankful that you know me fully. And I, I want to know you fully. So God, reveal yourself to us today. Reveal your love to us today. 
And as we receive it, I pray that it would make us different people. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.